Ambassadors, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the United Nations Conference Room 5 and this Pathways to Peace event, focusing on early childhood development and peace building. My name is Mark Feeney, a member of the Early Childhood Peace Consortium, and I will help coordinate our way through today's busy schedule. Before I pass you over to Rima and formally start, we have a few housekeeping considerations for your safety and comfort. There are no planned alarms today. In the event of alarm, we should wait instructions from, the, from, Unis, or from Andrea and the Irish Mission and exit the conference room as advised. Secondly, all the restrooms are located past the canteen on the right-hand side, and we ask that you kindly refrain from any flash photography throughout today's proceedings. I would like to call upon the representatives from the missions to provide a few short welcoming words for today. Ambassador Mythen. I shouldn't have to work this. Um, thank you very much, Mark. It's a real pleasure to be here uh, and to welcome you, I suppose, to this, this event. Uh, as some of you will know, I spent most of my career dealing with Northern Ireland peace process issues going back to 1990. So that really dates me. Uh, and the, my very first job as a diplomat was working with the International Fund for Ireland, which is uh, a joint British-Irish body with, with US and other funding to really support reconciliation uh, and such issues. And I'm delighted to see references to the, the International Fund for Ireland, you know, and the support here. And for me, you know, I, I came to the UN last year uh, and... It, it always enthuses me when I, get a, when I get a moment to actually combine my UN work and my Northern Ireland uh, career. And it's lovely to see some, some friends here that I've known for many, many years around the table, including Gina and Andrew here. I won't tell you how far back we go, a long, long way back. Um, and, you know, for us, it's, you know, just, just some introductory remarks. It's, it's so, so important, um, this area of, of, of early childhood development, education, uh, as you know, last week we, we, we had the Sustainable Development Goals Summit. Uh, Ireland was involved in that back in 2015. And, and, and again, last week, crafting a political declaration. And for us, you know, you know achieving, achieving progress in the area of early childhood development is so important. Yes, to one or two specific Sustainable Development Goals, but across the board, really. And if, if you get it right... If you get it right early on in early years, you're halfway home in terms of, of development uh, and so many other issues. Just one little example from Northern Ireland. Um, a few years back, the Irish and British government set up uh, the International Monitoring Commission, which was a, a, a commission uh, of representatives to look at reasons why there was still residual paramilitary violence in Northern Ireland. And uh, they did a really good scoping exercise uh, comparing, uh, you know, areas where there was a lot of residual paramilitary violence and incidents, and economic social factors, and you know, access to education, areas where educational attainment was really falling short, and there was an absolute correlation in the mapping exercise in areas where 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 those factors are really not in, in good shape, and where there was residual violence and and young people continue to join paramilitary groups. One of the lessons we really learned from the Sustainable Development Goals process was not to go on hearsay or conjecture, but to look at data and empirical evidence. And for us, to, here was uh, really strong empirical evidence of the connection between lack of early childhood education, lack of opportunity, and, and what it means. And we don't just see it in Northern Ireland, we see it in Haiti with gangs, we see it in many parts of the world, you know, recruitment of child soldiers, where that opportunity is not available, is lost, uh, and it, it's really impactful. So just, this is a really, really important occasion for, for Ireland, for the mission of Ireland. We're, we're delighted to be associated with it. Um, I'm delighted to have been working with, with Colombia. We have a very strong relationship uh, with Colombia uh, and with... with um, uh, with uh, the, the representatives of Chile. We work very close with both missions. Both, both missions gave us a tough time during the SDG negotiations, and that's rightly so. That's rightly so. They challenge us very strongly. Likewise, uh, delighted to have Mexico here, the representatives of Mexico, to have the special representative uh, of the Secretary General on Violence Against Children, uh, and as it says, uh, uh, Andrew Elliott from the Northern Ireland Bureau. So with that, I just want to say thank you. We look forward to a really good discussion today, and I think I'll come in later on during the panel discussion. Thank you, Mark. Thank you, Ambassador. 
Deputy Ambassador Tickner. Thank you. Um, um, thanks so much. I just want to acknowledge um, UNICEF, the Early Years Initiative, and the Permanent Missions of Ireland and Chile for their role in facilitating this important um, event and conversation. Um, we've been asked to speak quite briefly in general terms, and I'm going to time myself so I don't abuse my time. Um, let me start by stating the obvious. Um, what takes place in early years has fundamental lifelong consequences. Um, for example, social groups in situations of vulnerability with low investment during early childhood achieve obviously worse results in education and professional careers, are more prone to illness, enjoy, sh enjoy shorter average lifespans, and are at greater risk of becoming... Oh, I'm sorry. Sorry. I had no just, idea. It was just some introductory. It was an introductory. I had no idea. Sorry. Meeting. I guess I didn't follow the instructions. <laughs> Sorry. Um, I don't have anything to say other than welcome. Then so. <laughs> that was embarrassing. Sorry. I was ready to get right into it. Sorry. Um, thank you. Um, I just acknowledge my uh, partners here at the table. Um, we're very, um, very. Um, keen to participate in this conversation is what I want to say. Um, the issue of early childhood um, in the context of the current government of Gustavo Petro and Francia Marquez has become a fundamental question. Um, and I'll speak more about the issue after, but I just want to say that notwithstanding efforts that um, span the, a course of over a decade, I think um, in general we're still falling short um, of attending to the crucial needs of children in these specific age groups. And I'll talk about that in a bit. Sorry. <laughs> Thank you very much. And Deputy Ambassador Rudez. Thank you. I would have done just the same, actually. <laughs> yeah. I think I went the embarrassment. Def definitely not. Thank you. Thank you very much. Good morning, uh, Excellencies, colleagues. Uh, Ladies and gentlemen, I'm very uh, happy to be here today to sh be part of this discussion. Actually, uh, when you come to know early child development and the tools to address it, you know, you understand that it's key to so many of the things that we try to build in this institution here uh, later on and to make them sustainable. So this is a critical intervention. So um, I'm happy to say that my country has some experience on it. It started more than around 15 years ago at least, uh, and it's proven uh, very instrumental uh, to build a more cohesive, sustainable, resilient society, families, children, you know, all the components. So it would be very interesting to, to hear others also their experience. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, so we'll move on quick. We have a busy agenda today and limited time. It gives me great pleasure to pass you over to the Chair of the Early Childhood Peace Consortium, Dr. Rima Sala. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Excellencies, the Ambassadors, Dr. Najat Maalla Majid, Special Representative of the Secretary General for Children and Violence, distinguished representatives of the non-governmental organizations, ladies and gentlemen. It gives me great pleasure and honor to welcome you to this UNGA high-level session, Early Childhood Development, Pathways to Sustainable Peace. I wish to express my gratitude and the appreciation of the Early Childhood Peace Consortium to the mission of Ireland, Chile, and Colombia for sponsoring this timely event. I would also like to thank our eminent and renowned speakers for their commitment to demonstrate by science, policy, and practice the importance of investing in early childhood development as a sustainable pathway to peace. In this event, we also celebrate the 10th anniversary of the formation of the Early Childhood Peace Consortium, the 20th anniversary of the International Network of Peace Building with Young Children, and the 25th anniversary of the Good Friday Agreement. Most importantly, we celebrate families, parents, fathers, and mothers who toil every day to anchor peace 
in their homes and communities. Yes, we are living in a very critical global context marked by unprecedented threats to peace and security. Today, millions of families and their children find themselves trapped in situation of violent conflict, displacement, occupation, exacerbated by climate change, natural disasters, and COVID-19 pandemic. In 2022, according to Save the Children, approximately 468 million children were living in conflict zones. Also, according to UNHCR in 2022, of, more, of the more than 108 million forcibly displaced people, an estimated 43 million were children. This situation exposed children to the six UN violations, killing and maiming, violence, abduction, separation from their families, and denial of humanitarian assisting, leading to a crisis of care and learning. What is more alarming and should concern us all is the lasting negative impact of the deprivation and violence, physical and structural, on young children, eventually affecting our communities and our societies. But we always have good news. The good news and hope is that the emerging science heralds a new era for building peace. This is through the investment in young children, their parents, their families, and their communities as a path to peaceful and cohesive societies. The United Nations and the international community herald also a new era, a new vision for build, building a world of peace and development, an era where people are at the center of peace and development efforts, in an era of sustaining peace, in an era of inclusion and partnership with all members of society, including women, youth, and children in the service of peace. It is to raise the voice of science, to join the voice of we the people, that the Early Childhood Development Consortium was formed and launched at UNICEF in September 2013. It brought together many partners from multiple sectors, including government officials, UN agencies, non-governmental organizations, academia, practitioners, and also the private sector. This is to join forces with the international community to create an inclusive movement for peace, social justice, and prevention of violence, drawing on the transformative power of early childhood development strategies. Distinguished participants, the goals of the consortium that are, are aligned with the principles of the Convention on the Rights of the Child and the Sustainable Development Goals, in particular, Goal 3, 4, 5, and 16, include mobilizing increased investment in the early years of life and implementing more effective policies and practices in all countries, ensuring that early childhood programs are essential in promoting the culture of peace. Excellencies, distinguished participants, in this new era for peace, we have every opportunity to make this transformative shift and elevate early childhood development and their families to the new agenda for peace that is being discussed now. What we need from all of you, excellencies, distinguished participants, we need from the global community an unfailing vision an unwavering commitment, as well as a strong partnership for and with families, parents, and their children. Let us together start erecting building blocks like the children do, 
let erect building blocks for a peaceful future for our children, just to change the tide of violence and building a peaceful world with the children as the drivers for peace. Excellencies, distinguished participants, the time is now. We don't have, the time is now. Let us do it now. I thank you very much. Rima, thank you for your comments. So the work within the ECPC is broadly split into three thematic areas. Research, science, policy and advocacy, and programmatic activity. It now gives me great pleasure to introduce you to my colleagues who will provide you with an overview of work undertaken within these areas. Firstly, I would like to introduce you to James, or Jim Lechman, and Sasha Hine. Dr. Lechman is a Neeson Harris Professor of, Chi of Child and Adolescent Psychiatry, Psychology and Pediatrics at the Child Studies Centre in Yale School of Medicine. And Dr. Hine is a Professor of Education Psychology at the Free University of Berlin. Both are co-chairs of the ECPC Research Group. Thank you so much, Mark. And it's a pleasure and honour to be here. And it's great to see all of you in person as opposed to on the internet. And uh, I'm going to be very brief because uh, <coughs> Sasha has uh, a formal presentation that he's going to be making. But I would just echo some of the words that uh, uh, Rima has shared with you, that it's so much um, so important for us to try and build a more peaceful world by investing in our children. And I guess it also brings to mind some of the work that we've done over the years. And uh, Rima mentioned this, but this is actually the anniversary for the publication of this book, Pathways to Peace, the Transformative Power of Children and Families. And wonderfully, uh, Catherine Panterbrick and Rima were also the co-editors of this volume. And in a discussion that I had last night with Suna, uh, she's hoping that we can actually come up with a new edition. And what's interesting about this book is that it covers not only the ground of what's going on clinically, what's going on actually in the field, what the research says, but also what the basic science also has to say. So uh, putting it all together and bringing it up to date makes uh, very good sense to me. Um, but of course, I want to thank the representatives from the states of Ireland, from Colombia, from Chile, Muchas gracias. And we're very grateful for your investment in this opportunity and making it happen. Without your participation and sponsorship, we would not be sitting here this morning. So we're very grateful for that. And of course, uh, Mark and uh, Shaban, uh, they're also the ones that in this very short time frame made this a reality. It's also great to be sitting across from Josh Fetter, who I've had interactions with over the years whether it was in Palestine or in Northern Ireland, although I'm not sure I've actually met him in Northern Ireland, but uh, it's amazing to see him. And thank you so much, Josh, for the work that you're doing and for putting together, along with uh, Mark Litziv and Shaban, uh, this volume that I think we all have an opportunity to take a look at. So um, I also just want to thank my friends and colleagues at uh, UNICEF uh, we're looking forward to the event this afternoon at the Danny Kay Auditorium. And it makes me think also of uh, Kyle Pruitt. And uh, Marsha is right here as well. And it's really wonderful to, uh, we're going to be able to see um, this young group of people from New Haven uh, singing this uh, song, uh, It's uh, Seeds of Peace. It will really be a wonderful opportunity for all of us in the All Children's Choir. So... Um, I guess having said a word about Kyle Pruitt, I should also say whatever else is true during today's uh, presentations, we also need to remember not only to focus on the mothers and the children, but the fathers as well. <laughs> and um, we need to find a way to uh, bring that to the forefront in terms of our thoughts as well. And I'm going to turn the floor over shortly to Sasha, but I also want to say, Paul Connolly, I haven't seen you in such a long time but he was also the co-chair of this uh, research group uh, for many years. I'm not sure a decade is the right word, but uh, for many years. So thank you for coming, and thank you for bringing with you 
your friends and colleagues from Northern Ireland and uh, best wishes with regard to the Lynx Initiative. Um, that's something that can really make a difference around the world. So I think uh, with that, I'm going to say the floor is yours. Thank you. Um, thank you very much, Jim. Uh, thank you for the opportunity uh, to present some of our research uh, in what uh, Jim just said, a more formal way, a more formal presentation. So we know that in uh, the early years, uh, accessible and quality early childhood learning opportunities, stimulation and also responsive caregiving uh, can contribute to peace and human security, uh, including social cohesion and the reduction of conflict. Such efforts have neurobiological foundations that shape the early life experiences of the developing child, particularly in the, er in the first three years of life. These experiences lay the foundation for violent or peaceful relations and behaviors later in life. <clears throat> so we conducted a systematic review of uh, the interdisciplinary research that was generated by ECPC members uh, that can help a peaceful, equitable and sustainable uh, world through effective ECD programming uh, and services. We identified 203 research studies conducted in 25 countries on five continents that draw the connections between parenting, uh, children's biobehavioral development, and also peace building efforts. This means that the ECPC on average published over two studies in peer reviewed top tier journals per month on early childhood development and peace building outcomes over the, eight, over the past eight years. In our research, we've captured the voices of over 48,000 children and youth, along with their stories, uh, about half of whom have participated in intervention studies and efforts around the globe, and over 13,000 caregivers. So this slide shows the sites in which uh, the research has been conducted. Uh, and clearly the ECPC is a global movement and the partners are engaged in basic and applied research around the globe. Large scale intervention studies were implemented in recent years, for instance, in Sierra Leone by Teresa Bettencourt. The research conducted by our colleague, Catherine Panterbrick and her colleagues in Jordan is another remarkable example that addresses biobehavioral foundations of stress and resilience uh, as well as the impact of a psychosocial support intervention on social networks of youth. From this work, uh, we have learned that continuous and coordinated research drives innovation in early childhood care and education. Pre-primary education and early childhood parenting programs can significantly improve early learning and also decrease harsh discipline as a family foundation for conflict and caregiving stress. Elevating children's learning outcomes and diminishing the prevalence uh, of harsh discipline serves as critical underpinnings for fostering sustainable peace in regions affected by conflict and other crises. Teaching all caregivers, as we heard, including the fathers, about the importance of early childhood is a crucial element of such programs. One example is the Supporting Father Involvement Program, developed and implemented globally by our dear colleagues, uh, Kyle and Marsha Bruitt, and their colleagues, Philip and Carolyn Cohen. Developing and implementing self-sustaining programs and also promoting stak stakeholder involvement are key elements to ensure widespread peace building and successful implementation of programs of proven value. Recent research in hard to access regions has shown that caregiver-guided education and mass media can contribute to peace and stability. The collaborative research conducted by our colleague Hiro Yashikawa, Sesame Workshop, and the International Rescue Committee is a remarkable example which we will learn more about in today's event. Engaging youth in intergenerational programs is another driving force in successful peace-building efforts. The ECPC can continue to serve as a youth access point for intergenerational programs and tangible research opportunities that address early childhood, youth development, and peace building efforts. Clearly, a new generation of research is needed to better understand multi-level effects of ECD programs on social cohesion and community level aspects. 
<clears throat> to address today's uh, global inequities, we must work together uh, to better understand family and community dynamics and their implications for child development. So it is our responsibility to connect the dots on the global landscape uh, of research. <coughs> Coordinated research efforts will advance global investments to provide safe and nurturing environments for children to thrive. Now you've seen one example of how to build such a sheltering environment for children and families. The foundation and the exterior may not always be perfect. Fortunately, centuries-old mathematics uh, tells us that there are 88 ways to build a shelter like the one you can see here. So more research is urgently needed to determine these pathways. It's certainly going to be more than 88 uh, through which these efforts can bring the transformative power of early childhood education and care to even more children, thereby contributing to peace and stability. Donors, governments, and policymakers must prioritize investments uh, in translational research on the relationship between early childhood development and peace building outcomes, such as social cohesion, community mobilization, diversified social networks, and trust. We invite you to read the full report of our research activities that's included in your folders and also available on, today, on this event's website. Please join us in realizing our ambitious research to endure peace and stability for generations to come. We are grateful to all children, youth, families, and teachers who have contributed to this research. May their dedication be our guiding light. Thank you. Vice Penny to, to highlight some of the work undertaken by the EC, ECPC Policy and Advocacy Group. Suna's work at ACHEV involves building collaborative partnerships on managing the transfer and implementation of ACHEV's educational programs to local organisations in numerous countries, including Cambodia, Tanzania, Laos, Lebanon, Saudi Arabia, and Brazil. Suna is also the chairperson of the Policy and Advocacy Working Group at the ECPC. Suna. Thank you, Mark. Good morning, thank you. Before I begin, let me say that it's a great honor and privilege to have the opportunity to address this distinguished audience on a matter that's very near and dear to my heart, children and families, and peace both today and generations to come. Today, more specifically, I'll be speaking about the early childhood developments and, and its promise for peace. Today, as a global community, we're facing a momentous and an incredibly complex challenge. Inequality is on the rise. Conflict is also increasing globally. Such conflict impact people of all ages. But children, children are particularly the ones who are vulnerable to violence and neglect. Would you believe me if I tell you 250 million children under age five, presently living in low and middle income countries, are at great risk for not reaching their full potential. And globally, just last year, nearly half a billion, approximately 468 million children were living in conflict zones. That makes one out of six children. And it's keep on increasing. There was a 2.8 increase from the previous year. This reality has a profound impact on children. The, the impact is compounded with the fact that children and parents experience immense stress when enduring war and adapting to challenges of displacement. So when children are exposed to these adversities, at an early age, they experience something we call toxic stress, which is associated with a broad range of negative life outcomes, including significant behavioral and emotional problems, all that limit developmental potential. And children are disproportionately impacted by poverty and war, exposing them to toxic stress. And, and then it all perpetuates intergeneral um, cycles of poverty and violence. So 
it is vital that we invest in global solutions that are going to be able to disrupt these cycles of violence, build strong foundations for sustainable development and social cohesion, and promote a culture of peace. And this is where ECD has a role to play. Early childhood development is the most formative period in our lives. So by intervening in that early stage and that important stage, early childhood development actually offers a unique opportunity. It is cost effective and it has sustainable impact. And early childhood development services protect children, foster resilience to the detrimental impacts of toxic stress. A second key message of ours is early childhood development services cannot succeed in a silo. They have to be very strategic. They have to be multi-level. They need to be not just focused on the child alone, but on the whole ecosystem that surrounds young children. Caregivers, family, community, the institutions, and it has to be there has to be adequate funding. It has to be fully supported. Public and private sector coordination is necessary to provide a nurturing care framework, good health, adequate nutrition, safety and security, responsive caregiving, and opportunities for early learning. We just heard from Professor Lechman and Professor Hein, research is increasingly showing that early childhood programs promote key measures for peace. It has been shown to lead lower rates of violence in the home and greater social cohesion in the communities, promote healthy neurobiology, foster resilience in the children. And there, ha there have been numerous longitudinal studies that have shown participation in quality early childhood development programs, improved health and well-being and education and employment and income, and reduced violence and criminal behaviors in adulthood. So let me conclude with a brief note on Early Childhood Peace Consortium's global strategy to address this global challenge. So we are going to be advocating for expanded early childhood development services and public policies ensuring long-term effectiveness, disseminate knowledge. I encourage you to look at your folders. We have some policy and advocacy articles there. We will initiate new research to document the positive impacts of early childhood development program interventions on peace and social cohesion. And lastly, we want to work with all of you, including public and private sector actors, on new early childhood development services interventions in challenging contexts and expand child access to existing early childhood services. We believe together we can meet this challenge, but we need you. We need your help. Thank you. And finally, within this section of the programme, I have the great pleasure of introducing Josh Fetter and Ali Shar. Dr. Fetter is a child psychiatrist in Solana Beach, California. He is editor in chief at the Carlet Child Psychiatry Report. He also serves as a programmatic lead for the Executive Council of the International Network on Peacebuilding for Young Children. Dr. Shar is a Palestinian physician from Nablus who studied medicine in the former Czechoslovakia. Through witnessing firsthand the impact of war on children in his country, Dr. Shar developed the passion and desire to work for the cause of protecting all children from war and conflict by engaging with the International Network for Peacebuilding and the Early Childhood Peace Consortium. Gentlemen, you have the floor. Good morning. I'm Josh Fader, a child and family psychiatrist and, uh, as Mark said, programmatic lead for the International Networking Group on Peacebuilding with Young Children, the INPB, or as we call it, the network. Along with my colleague, Dr. Ali Shar, also a physician and director of the Palestinian Child Institute at Anajan National University and fellow member of our network, we are honored to address this session. And we would like to update you on the work of the INPB and the Early Childhood Peace Consortium. I'd like to thank our sponsoring UN missions, Ireland, Colombia, and Chile, along with the many honorable dignitaries and distinguished guests 
present today, Dr. Rima Sala and the Early Childhood Peace Consortium, UNICEF, and of course my fellow members of the IMPB. Today we're launching our new book, Foundations for a Peaceful World, The Transformative Power of Early Childhood Development in Building Peace and Social Cohesion. This is the follow-up from our 2007 volume called From Conflict to Peace Building, The Power of Early Childhood Initiatives, Lessons from Around the World. The aim of our new book is to inspire you and affirm your commitment to peace building with young children by showcasing authentic voices from the IMPB. Our network operates on a foundation of six principles, all of which are reflected in the reports from the member countries. Pomostesi in Serbia uses a child-centered, socio-ecological approach, paying attention to power relations in the context of continuing societal conflicts resulting from the breakup of Yugoslavia. Our colleagues in Tajikistan debated, designed, and implemented an effective multilingual Uzbek-Tajik learning approach. It's a great example of how we in the network use information, scientific knowledge, people's experiences, and wisdom in the design and development of our programs. We also see this process in Palestine, where the pain of Palestinian children drives efforts that led to the first pan-Arab conference on early childhood development and peace building, addressing the impact of armed conflict and violence on young children, their families and communities, and the way in which societies can benefit from policies and programs that build peaceful societies, social justice, and sustainability. The Children as Zone of Peace campaign in Nepal has restored child rights after an armed conflict in which the schools were commandeered as military posts. The program attends to power relations and building institutional capacity for good governance, bringing a sense of safety and justice and combating child abuse. The Magic Journey in Kyrgyzstan is a successful pilot program with promising impact on children's attitudes about gender and ethnic diversity demonstrating how we use scientific knowledge, people's wisdom, and practical experiences to advocate for public policies and programs in the interest of peace, social justice, and sustainability. The Personadol program in Israel is bringing together disparate communities using Personadols representing multicultural groups with young children and families from those groups in early childhood educational settings. The network helps countries articulate their early childhood development <laughs> and peace-building policies. Imagine how you can replicate how our colleagues in Lebanon built a rights-based youth program in a complex national context that begs for policies to promote political, cultural, social, economic, and environmental progress. Our team in Northern Ireland works with our revised toddler module of the Media Initiative for Children employing a learning approach which attends to power processes and outcomes by building and operating a scalable, nested system of reflective practice where children are supported by parents using responsive caregiving approaches, parents are supported by the staff in the midst of their busy lives, and staff have regular reflective support. Our controlled trial demonstrated marked improvements in children's social emotional functioning and decreased stress in staff and parents. We're now exploring options to extend this activity beyond the trial through identifying funding opportunities. To that end, we are working closely with the team in early years to develop a proposal for the new Peace Plus program to expand this with an ambition to transform post-conflict ECD practice and services within Northern Ireland and the border region of the Republic of Ireland for future generations. I'll now pass you over to Ali to talk more about his lived experience and his vision of how our network transforms the process of peace building. Thank you, Josh. On the 12th of January, 2002, and while driving to my work in Ramallah from Nablus, listening to the radio to check the road in a security challenged area. The speaker on the radio announced that an eight years old boy was shot dead on that road, coming back by, with his father from the cinema. The shot was directly to the head 
and the child could only say, I love you, Dad, before he died. I was in shock. And three questions came to my mind. First, what does it feel for a father bringing his child from the cinema and instead of kissing, kissing him good night, he would kiss him goodbye and bury him by his hand. The second question, what did this eight years old Israeli child do to us Palestinians to deserve being killed? I repeat, what did this Israeli child, eight years old, do to Palestinians to get killed? And third, how closer to Palestinian state did this killing of the child bring us? On the 12th of April 2002, and that is three months later, in the middle of Israeli invasion in my city, Nablus, my wife gave birth to a 34 weeks premature boy. Under military action, no ambulance could approach us to take the child to the hospital that he needed. Few hours later, we lost the child. And of course, I got the answer to my first question. How does it feel? Because I felt it. And I buried my child under the curfew in the garden of the house because no cemetery was approachable at that time. But I did not get the answer to the two questions. First, what did this infant do to Israel to deserve being killed? And yet I don't have the answer to the third question. How closer to security did Israel get by killing my infant boy? He would have been 21 years old, a young man, hopefully contributing to building peace, but he is not here. My colleagues from the International Network on Peace Building will tell you similar and maybe more heartbreaking stories from around the world, testifying for the impact of war on the children. We came together, we brought humanity, we brought knowledge, and we brought power to build or try to build a better future for the children to come. And inspired by the Irish experience in the Good Friday Agreement, we started to seek and sometimes see the light on the, at the other end of the tunnel. And while the journey was not easy, here we stand and show the work and seek your attention and support. Joining the Early Childhood Peace Consortium added to our strength and enabled us to reach wider groups of supporters to the cause of children and peace. We know that decisions about war and peace are made here, I mean at the UN. And we know how difficult is the global situation these days. We, however, know that your decisions affected and continue to affect children disproportionately. And we want you, to, when making those decisions, to think about your children, your grandchildren, and do your best to offer them a future when a child would ask, Dad, what is war? And not to become another victim of it. In the book we present to you today, we bring these stories faces and genuine voices of children and those working with them. We hope that it will inspire and lead your effort to preserve childhood and move your decision and discussions towards what makes the world a better place for children of the globe.
Thank you, Ali. Our book presents an array of voices and realities from regions impacted by conflict, each with a different way of thinking shaped by the culture and experiences of the authors. Expect to be challenged by some of these pieces, and yet our deepest hope is that you will experience a sense of connection with people of even one of these countries, that you will share our belief in the principles of the IMPB, and that you will affirm your commitment to support the work of our network. We are dedicated to the achievement of UN Sustainable Development Goals for education, peace building, and partnerships. Our network calls for recognition of early childhood development and peace building in a UN resolution, support for advocacy and policy engagement, support for research and for services, and the development of effective partnerships to achieve these aims. Thank you. This brings us to the next section of our program, and we're delighted to have a, such a, a distinguished panel with us today. Facilitating this session, we have Dr. Catherine Panderbrick. Catherine is a professor of anthropology, health, and global affairs at Yale University. Catherine leads research initiatives to develop sustained, equitable partnerships across academic, community, and policy networks. Her research and program evaluations with Afghan and Syrian refugees are leading examples of systems-level work on child and adolescent development, mental health, and social cohesion in war-affected communities. Catherine is also a member of the ECPC Expert Group and Research Working Group. Catherine. Can you hear me? Um, so thank you very much. We have a distinguished uh, panelist here. I want to introduce them very briefly first and then maybe ask them a question for them to talk to us a little bit. Um, and I understand that um, Deputy Permanent Representative of Chile is Mr. René Ruidas. So I hadn't seen you. Thank you very much. So you are a lawyer from the University of Chile and you've held... Um, many interesting positions, and I'm reading just one of them as Deputy Director and Head of the Indigenous Affairs Unit, Human Rights Directorate, and Directorate of Hu European Affairs. And abroad, you've served in many embassies in Chile, but your diplomatic work for the mission of Chile to the United Nations is being in charge of human rights issues. So thank you for being with us today. Um, Ambassador Arlene Tickner. <laughs> here. Um, you're the Deputy per Permanent Present Representative of Colombia to the United Nations, and you've started this role uh, in 2023, as I understand. Um, before your arrival to the Permanent Mission, you were a Professor uh, of International Relations and Director of Research in the School of Political Science, Government, and International Relations at the Universidad del Rosario, Bogota, Colombia. Um, so you are a, a Political Science Professor. Thank you for being with us today as well. Um, Dr. Najad Malamajid, uh, you are um, a, the Special Representative of the Secretary General on Violence Against Children and a member of the ECPC Executive Committee. You're a medical doctor in pediatrics um, who, over the last three decades of life, four decades of life, <laughs> And going, as you devoted your life to the prom promotion and protection of children's rights. First as head of the pediatric department and director of the Hey Hussani Mother Child Hospital in Casablanca. Um, as a member of the Moroccan National Council on Human Rights. Um, as the United Nations Special Rapporteur on the Sale of Children, Child Prostitution and Child Pornography. And you have many numerous awards and honors for your strong commitment for the protection of the rights of the child. So thank you for being with us as well. Ambassador um, Fergal Meithen, um, it's a pleasure to, to, to have you with us. You're the permanent representative of Ireland to the United Nations. Uh, you've spent a very number of decades <laughs> of your career working uh, for the government of Ireland in support of the Northern Ireland peace process and the implementation of the Good Friday Agreement. Um, you recently, as Director General of Ireland, UK and American Division of the Department of Foreign Affairs, you've led teams that have worked on Northern Ireland, Irish-British relations, Irish-US, Irish-Canadian relations, and relations with Latin America and Caribbean regions. So you're a key player in terms of Ireland's position on the globe. Thank you for being with us. Um, Ms. Gina McIntyre, hi. 
Um, uh, you're the, the chief executive of the special European Union programs body called SEUPP, um, which is a cross-border body established under the Good Friday Agreement and working to the government of Ireland and the Northern Ireland Assembly. So what's key for you is that you've gained this extensive knowledge of the complex cross-border development needs of the region and the European funding instruments that are available to foster peace and prosperity in the cross-border region. So thank you very much for being with us as well. Um, Ms. Sherry Weston, you are president of Sesame Workshop Hi. Um, and also member of EC ECPC Advisory Board. You lead a, a really famous organization's effort to serve vulnerable children through mass media and targeted initiatives around the world. Um, you really uh, spearhead a partnership with the RSC, the International Rescue Committee, to bring early education to children in humanitarian crises. And that was the first, you were, the, you were awarded the Sesame Workshop, was awarded the largest early childhood intervention in the history of mankind in, in terms of humanitarian responses. So this is a very big deal for advancing um, education for early children around the world. So thank you very much. Um, I am going to start um, in, in this order, perhaps uh, as a question to Mr. Roy Diaz from the Mission of Chile. Um, to start with, Chile provides this really exemplary global model for this intersectorial, multifaceted approach to early childhood development policy making. And Chile Crece Contigo is praised at this incredible policy for scaling up investment in the early years of life. My question is, to what extent does the Chilean government and Chile Crece Contigo initiative strategically invest in supporting young children and pregnant women as a pathway, as a mechanism, as a way to foster socially cohesive and peaceful communities? Thank you very much, Catherine, again. Uh, I'm very happy to be here, and I want to thank actually the public, the experts, the academics, you know, the civil society, to bring this issue to our agenda here on the margins of the third committee. It's so pertinent. I, I said it before. Uh, we uh, strive a lot here to work about uh, ending conflict, but and we talk a lot about prevention. This is such a powerful tool for prevention you know, when it should be done. So it's very important to make awareness uh, about this. And I think it should be part of the many efforts in peace building, peacekeeping, and many of the things we build here, you know, to start from the very early ages of, of, of people, of, of children. In the case of Chile, uh, we have a long tradition about uh, protecting childhood, you know, I would say 20th century, the mid of 20th century, although the focus then was alleviate food shortages, poverty, and the gaps in healthcare. Uh, in this development, you know, certainly a big milestone was the program Chile Crece Contigo, Chile Grows With You, uh, in order to help boys and girls to reach their full development potential. That was around 2007, and as it was said, the first systematic, intersectoral, structured policy for protecting early childhood rights. Mm -hmm. And you know, this has become an state policy. And in spite of change of governments of very different political persuasions in 15 years, this is uh, the state policy, you know, and we aim to expand, to extend, and to give more, more resources. You know, this, the present situation is not easy, but we are aware that this is a key intervention. Um, in that line, I would like just to share the main features of what Chile Crece Contigo involves. You know that basically the premise is the importance of thinking about persons throughout the life course, starting from the early childhood. Chile is also a very strong promoter of, of the rights of people of older age, you know, because we have this holistic approach of the life course. You know, but of course, these are the two extremes, and you need, we need to get above both. So, uh, Chile Que Se Contigo is a social protection system to accompany, protect, support all children and their families through an integrated system of universal social interventions and offer differentiated benefits for children in vulnerable situations. 
This program provides children with expedited access to services and benefits to meet their needs and to support their development at each state of growth. It applies for children from zero to nine years old. We believe that really this program is instrumental in advancing the right path towards a more equitable, inclusive, cohesive, and peaceful society. Not only supporting children, but also the families and the communities where they grow and develop. Uh, I would say that perhaps one expression of this that Chile has for two decades at least, a very vibrant and very active civil society, including the students. <laughs> and you might make some connection that uh, if you have care about the formation, you know, in the early years, the people have the right instruments to become involved in society issues, you know, in a constructive manner. Yeah? So, and also, you know, it has shown uh, throughout the years that the level of attendance for a school and, uh, and nursery schools, you know, have uh, increased. So we also see some kind of connection with the, this early intervention. So what includes uh, the program? First, an educational program aiming to inform, educate, and raise awareness about child care, respectful parenting and stimulation aimed at children and families. The idea is to foster positive family and community environments to contribute to the well-being of children to achieve their full potential. It includes a set of resources that are available online for parents and caregivers with language for playing videos, educational material to support the upbringing of children. In addition, it has a fund for interventions to support child development, with the objective of supporting modalities such as itinerant, itinerant stimulation services, home care, stimulation rooms, and toy libraries, the development of children who are behind, at risk, or in delay, in other situations of biopsychosocial vulnerability that might affect them. This is a national fund that, through agreements with the municipalities, allows the implementation of support modalities for child development that complement the development of children with special needs. A third component is that because we are aware of the need of the children that are farthest, farthest behind, the program includes a component of guaranteed benefits aimed at children and their families belonging to the 60% of the country's most vulnerable households. These are technical aids for children with disabilities <coughs> together with free access to nurseries, kindergarten, or equivalent modalities. As I said, we have seen results, you know, in school attendance, which seem to have a connection with this intervention, but... Uh, we are very committed to continue developing the, this program and to learning from other experiences as well. As well. Thank you very much. You, you know, I, w I want thank you for your emphasis on state policy to support positive family environments because that is very unique and very um, exemplary of Chile. Thank you very much. Um, Turning to Ambassador Tickner uh, for the Mission of Colombia, um, would you unpack for us a little bit the concept of pathways to peace from the Colombian perspective? So Colombia, as I, I, is a country that has led processes to end armed conflict, but also remarkably supported a more comprehensive approach to peace processes um, through addressing the root causes of conflict. And that's done through rural reform, political participation, addressing rights. But it's much more bigger in its vision than just ending violence. So could you, could you speak to that experience um, and where the investment in early childhood development can come as one of the pathways to building this more comprehensive, more inclusive, more sustainable peace. Thank you. Thank you. I'll forego the, the, uh, the thanks that I started with in my first intervention. It will save some time. Um, I just want to acknowledge what's already been said. First off, I would like to express my sympathies to Mr. Shah. Um, your stories resonated profoundly with the experiences of many in, in Colombia as well. And so my, 
Um, we've heard, um, I don't have to repeat the empirical evidence. Um, there's resounding empirical evidence on the importance of early investments um, in, in childhood in terms of creating pathways to um, more full livelihoods and also to peace. So I will forego any discussion of that. But I just want to add to the list of, 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 of important paths created by these investments. Um, the avoidance of risks of becoming involved in criminal, criminal activities would just be an additional factor that I want to point out. Colombia is a country that's not only undergoing um, multiple conflicts, um, but these are conflicts that not only entail insurgent groups, but criminal groups. And one of the greatest risks that our youth faces is that of recruitment and participation in both armed insurgent activities, but also criminal activities related to our armed conflicts. Um, I think we've also heard that there's a resounding evidence that shows that the negative um, outcomes um, normally associated with the lack of early interventions can actually be avoided by comprehensive actions taken both um, aimed at pregnant women and lactating women, caregivers, and children during early childhood years. So in addition to producing all of these positive impacts that we've heard in education, employment, health, um, I think also development initiatives that focus on creating an, an, I will call it an ethos of nurturing and care can foster behaviors in children and caregivers that are conducive to Pacific coexistence and to tolerance of difference, um, which we haven't mentioned either. Um, creating a, an environment in which difference is not deemed a, a threat or a problem, but actually something that enriches the social fabric, I think is something that we should point out as, 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 as achievable um, via these types of interventions. So I want to talk you through quickly um, Colombia's experiences. The, there's been efforts starting basically in 2010 to create compre a comprehensive social protection system targeted towards children and their families. And this has been an important um, part of Colombia's national development plans um, now for almost two decades. Um, in 2010, the government also began negotiations with the FARC. Um, we now have a peace accord with this group that's being implemented. And, and since that time, I would say that the emphasis on the relation between early childhood development on the one hand and sustainable peace has grown. Um, and in the context of the current government of Gustavo Petro, this has become a centerpiece um, of the government's approach to social justice and total peace. The two factors go together, obviously. Um, I just want to speak of several initiatives that the government is launching. First, there's a pact on infancy and adolescence that prioritizes the poorest and most vulnerable populations in several hundred municipalities of Colombia. This is an approach that looks to take into account the, the territorial differences um, that are required to keep in mind when we do these types of intervention, um, given the, the tremendous variation of needs of, of children and youth um, in different parts of Colombia's territory. Um, in addition, a new national caregiving, caregiving system is being created by our new Ministry of Equality and Equity, headed by Vice President Francia Marquez, to address the needs of children, people with disabilities, and older persons in a more systematic and comprehensive fashion. Colombia is a country, as many are, in which um, uh, several 19 million women um, provide unpaid caregiving activities. And one of the purposes of this effort, in addition to involving men and fathers, is to recognize the role played by caregivers and, and support them in their efforts to provide more nurturing environments um, to children and, and others that need care. Um, third, um, combating hunger and malnutrition is, is another priority. Colombia is one of the countries in South America that continues to endure um, a tremendous hunger crisis, sadly, which has been aggravated um, after the, the, the pandemic. Um, there's uh, several... Uh, dozens of thousands of reported cases of acute malnutrition in young children and, and sadly um, widespread chronic um, denutrition and obesity. 
Um, added to this, we have 2,300,000 Venezuelans um, in our national territory, approximately 30% of which are children. And so this, this added an additional burden um, to efforts to um, create early intervention strategies. Lastly, and I just don't want to leave this out, calls for decarbonization and green transition, I think, are a fundamental part of at least my government's view of how we go about creating pathways. Because if there is no planet um, to inherit to our children, um, we really, all of these other interventions really make little sense. Um, no less important, and I want to just go quickly through this, investments in basic services and caregiving in early childhood development help reduce the risk of violence against children. We've talked about pathways to peace, but not violence against children. One example of a multi-stakeholder and multifaceted strategy in Colombia adopted um, in 2021 is this National Action Plan Against Violence Against Children and Adolescents. Um, on this subject, I just wanted to announce that Colombia will host the first global ministerial conference to end violence against children in 2024. And we see this as a prime opportunity, um, I'm going to say not to think outside the box, but to actually throw away the box and, and devise more audacious strategies to address this fundamental issue. Let me just end by stressing, and I know I've gone over time, um, the importance of robust multi-stakeholder strategies um, to address these issues. Um, and yet, if we don't insert these strategies within more structural changes, which is essentially the notion of total peace and putting life in the center of our public policies that my government is promoting, I think many of them will fall, fall short of the demands of today's tremendously complex world and the needs of our children, including those um, in early childhood. So I think we need to think about the structural context within which these efforts take place. Because interventions focused solely on accompanying early childhood without structural change more widely it, are, are, deemed, are, are doomed to fall short of the needs of today's world. Thank you. So, Ambassador Tickner, it is very well heard your message, which is, if I can translate it, transform an ethos of care into a system of care that addresses needs and fights against violence and for social justice. So thank you very much for this systems lens view on what we need to achieve. Um, my question to Ambassador Mython for the mission of Ireland, um, as a preamble, I, the Irish government has been deeply involved in peace and reconciliation process on the island of, of Ireland for over 25 years. And it's known that um, you know, the government of Ireland has taken risks for peace, uh, engaging often with groups. It's been pivotal in engaging with groups that often fall outside the mainstream peace-building institutions. So my question to you is what lessons or best practice have we learned from these inclusive experiences. Ambassador Tigner was talking about respecting differences. And why is it important that that work is continued now on a global scale? That's a very big question. Um, firstly, just thank, thank you all. Uh, it's an extraordinary gathering here and it's an absolute privilege to be, to be here. Um, I couldn't name all the names, but just really the, 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 the level of expertise, of practice, of experience gathered here is quite phenomenal. And, but I should have mentioned you, Dr. Rima, at the very start, given your work in the consortium. I'm sorry for, for, for not mentioning it at the very start. Um, I, I think the question you say, 25 years, to be honest, you know, you know, a peace process is a process and it started way before 1998, way before the Good Friday Agreement. Uh, the Irish government was involved in, in processes going back to the early 1970s. Uh, reaching out both politically uh, but also in terms of community groups, just, just find, trying to find ways forward. Made mistakes, you know, we ran, we ran into cul-de-sacs, um, but, you know, that question of inclusive engagement, building a process that brings everybody in and leaves nobody behind to use UN speak, was very, very important and it was culminated in the Good Friday Agreement. And it's in no way an Irish government achievement. It's an achievement of the people of Northern Ireland with the assistance of the Irish and British governments, the US and the European Union. And it's, it's wonderful to see uh, the EU uh, special programmes body represented here. For Ireland, we look at the European Union as one of the greatest peace processes of all time. And certainly we drew inspiration and, and, and many political leaders in Northern Ireland, including John Hume, drew inspiration uh, and vision and, and practices which then inspired the peace process. Um, 
But for us, it, it, it was always about bringing people in. What is the Good Friday Agreement? It, it addresses the, the political causes and drivers of conflict. Uh, it has been pretty successful in turning off the violence. Not, not completely, but reasonably successful. It has been less successful in building political stability in Northern Ireland. It's been a bit stop-starty uh, in terms of political process. Uh, the third flank, though, was reconciliation and building relationships within Northern Ireland, between North and South of Ireland, between Britain and Ireland. And there, I think, that's been less successful. It's been more challenging. And it's been knocked off course more easily. So, the, the, you know, the, the guns are largely silent uh, the political process continues, stop, start, but it's a political process. But reconciliation is really difficult. And there's a whole variety of reasons for that. Um, and it takes constant engagement. It is genuinely a process, not an event. It takes constant engagement, including, including uh, you know, at, at very, uh, in the very early years, to bring it back to what we're discussing today. I mean, I mean in Northern Ireland, in the Good Friday Agreement, um, we acknowledge that there was a real problem with education, that young people are not educated together. They're educated in, 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 in schools in their own communities. There's lots of reasons for that. It's not that parents are bad. There are lots of really strong societal reasons why that's the case. But the reality is, back in 1998, I think some 7% of the child uh, school-going years were being educated together. That figure has shifted to 9%, Siobhan. I think it's hardly, the dial has hardly shifted. Um, so, and that is a problem, and you often talk to young people from Northern Ireland, and they say the first time they genuinely meet somebody from their community is when they go to university. Mm -hmm. They, you know, play different sports, uh, go to different schools, go to different discos, and living separate lives. And that's a real problem when it comes to real deep reconciliation. Not that we ask people to stop being British Unionist or Irish Nationalist, but that actually de developing relationships and awareness of, of the other viewpoint. So... I suppose recognising the difficulty there, you know, the, the, the Irish government uh, and the European Union and the International Fund for Ireland have really developed some programmes bringing young people together in a very systematic way. Um, I'm sure, Jeannie, you'll give more detail on some of those specific programmes. Uh, but for us, that's an ongoing commitment that didn't stop in 1998 and has to keep on going. And also bringing young people together from north and south of the island, bringing together people from Britain and Ireland. It, it's, it's, it's multifaceted, you know, there's three sets of relationships that have driven the peace process, three sets of relationships that, that can get knocked off course. Um, we all, I mean, for example, we, we thought things were going pretty well and then we had a, a Brexit discussion and that has, has driven, that has, that has driven, driven uh, communities apart. It has caused real difficulty. So we can never stop working at a peace process. We can never stop taking this for granted and we can never stop working with, with young people um, and ensuring access to education, ensuring access to opportunity, educational attainment. I mentioned the the report by the International Monitoring Commission about the, the correlation between lack of opportunity, lack of educational attainment, and then young people ending up in, in residual paramilitary groups or criminal gangs, as you, as you say. And, and there's often a, a kind of read across. Um, we've worked very closely with Colombia in, in sharing lessons, sharing lessons and ongoing lessons, and it's an ongoing process. It, it, really, it really hasn't stopped. Um, I don't often quote uh, Margaret Thatcher. Uh, probably she wouldn't be. Um, we, we, we love Tony Blair. We, 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 we like Margaret, maybe perhaps less. She said two things that I always stuck in my mind. One was she said there's no such thing as society. Well, she was completely wrong there. She did say, though, that money wouldn't solve the Northern Ireland conflict. And she was, she was half right there. You know, it was deep political issues, deep societal issues. So throwing money at was never going to be um, the whole solution. But it is part of a solution. It's part of a solution in terms of, of funding programmes, building economic and social development. That's really, really important. And it's a message we got through to President Reagan and Tip O'Neill in the 1980s, and hence the US support for the International Fund for Ireland. Uh, Ronald Reagan then persuaded Margaret Thatcher, and that's how we got that support. Uh, but people like Ronald Reagan, Tip O'Neill, and the European Union understand the need for sustained investment. And I, I was struck here by, by Sesame Workshop, the case for investing in young people is clear. It's clear, but it's not always delivered. It's not always easy. Um, and it's a hard battle. And, and one of the objectives that we were working on in the Sustainable Development Goals negotiation this year 
was trying to crack the issue of financing for development, financing for the SDGs, you know, we're a long way short. So again, jumping from the, the local in Northern Ireland to the, to the, to the global, uh, you know, to, to really tackle these issues around ed education, you know, early childhood education, funding is really important across the board. So Mark Thatcher was, 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 was half right on that, you know, but we do need funding um, and sustained investment and sustained research, and that's really, really important. That's why it's just for us to be associated with an event of this kind is really, really important. That was a very rambling um, tour de force from 1972 all the way up to today, but the work goes on. We can never give it up, and, and, and just hearing, hearing Dr. Ali talk about the Palestinian experience, I was here recently... Um, the Ukrainian mission showed a documentary, 20 Days in Mariupol, and there, you know, young, young children dying in their parents' arms. Uh, you know, we know children are, are, are such victims of conflict, um, and we know that, you know, that the cycles of violence can be repeated and repeated and repeated, if not addressed. So these are really, really important issues, and for the Irish mission to be associated with it, it it's something that we will keep on doing uh, into the future. We're with you all the way. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Thank you, Ambassador Mythen, and also for uh, pointing out that peace is an intergenerational um, effort, right? You don't give up once you've achieved something for one segment of society because it goes on and cascades. What you do cascades from one generation to the other, but it, was, it needs sustained engagement, and so thank you for that. Um, my, my then I turn to Dr. Majid, um, Special Representative on Violence Against Children, to keep my question really short, because you have the voice of a global organization, how can we ensure a child-focused, child-centered, child's right approach to ending violence against children by 2030? I will be very short, and um, I am really happy to be here, because I am surrounded by experts, and uh, you make me becoming young, you know, uh, as pediatrician, <laughs> and as child rights activist, and... I, just, I will be a little bit provocative today, as usual. I think uh, what is really the question you are addressing me, and we just finished you know, this wonderful SDG summit, and uh, I think the question is, the Agenda 2030 is not only one SDG, it's the 17 or nothing. They are interlinked, because you have the drivers of violence, the drivers, and you have also the protective factor. So it's not only tackling 16.2 and waiting next year, tackling one. It's a global thing. And it's echoing the interlinkages of all the children's rights and human rights. So this is really important. This is, for me, a big challenge, and we are pushing the agenda at global level regarding, you know, working with all countries who are presenting their VNR to make sure that it's embedded and they are not seeing as parallel programs or initiative, not embedded, you know, in the state policies, not in the national budget, but relaying, you know, on donors and depending on the uh, interest of donor-driven. So we have a lot of initiative, a lot of spot, and it's not, you know, uh, sustainable. This has made me having a big concern regarding this point. The other things, we all know that, you know, I was appointed on uh, 1st July 2019, five months after or four months since COVID starts. You have worldwide wars. The world is on fire. We are not able to build peace. We fail. And, this is, and we are currently trying because the best way to protect children is really to build peace. But the problem is for me currently today is really why we are lagging behind, as you are telling. And it is why this ministerial conference, I, am, I was telling, okay, it's fine, but stop, you know, having call for commitment, call for action, you know, another action, but really to think out of the box. We already know, and you provide the numbers, the numbers of children left behind worldwide you know, within the country, uh, within the conflict, during, before, during, and after conflict. And if you add to that the number of displaced people, the number not only of refugees in the refugee camp, deprived of liberty yeah. in camps, deprived, so th th this is awful what is going on worldwide. 
just, you know, in, in Campbell Hall, you have 31,500 children who are deprived of liberty. Children are detained, separated from their family. Sh children are paying a high tribute in mental health. I was in Lebanon, and when I was see, seeing and discussing with these children in this camp, really when you, and all of you know, when the light in the eyes of children switch off, it's too late. And I saw a lot, mental health. So we are really guilty, so sorry. I think it's not only calling here. We need to really tell ourselves we fail and why we fail. This is the other thing that we know, the impact. And uh, you know, we have all the evidence base, all the impact you know, on uh, children, their development. You know, we know it. We know also the economic impact and that investing, it makes economic sense. We know it also because you know, according to recent studies, you know, you know, violence against children within national countries, it's about 5% of the national GDP. So they can save it. And the cost of, you know, toxic stress, you know, all this impact is 393 US billion dollar per year. So my God, this, we know it. So this is another point. We, third, what we know, we have wonderful evidence-based program worldwide, multi because multi-stakeholder approach is easy to tell. But really, when you arrive at country level, and I'm visiting a lot of countries, it's not an easy task. And here, what is important, I think, you have all this wonderful evidence base, and I think what is missing for me, what, what I saw in, uh, in many countries, that we need to stop seeing children, even at young age, seeing families, fathers and mothers, mm -hmm. and hosting communities as passive recipients of services. Mm -hmm. They are key partners. And you have wonderful program, you know, I saw it in many countries that are still at country level and not here. And I think we need really to, we need to be very context specific. And we need, they are the users, they know very well what is working and what is not working. They are the experts. And among them, children and young people are really wonderful to hear. And I agree with you what you are doing is how we inform, you know, all these services by the voices and also the experiences and the concern of those who are using him. I think it's really, really important and needed more than ever. And the last but not the least, you are speaking about financing. And we are speaking a lot about financing. And I think we never saw a so huge crisis of multilateralism. Yeah. We never saw so huge divide within the world. And I think the big question today is really, and this is SDG 17, and what about, you know, how we can switch really about, you know, this donor-driven approach or based on some issues or some interests in a context-specific approach, in a partnership that is based on results and really to strengthen the system at local level and at central level. If we are not doing that, we will repeat the same scenario and we'll come back next year again speaking about that. And I think really we have to, to be very strong, and you can count on me, you know it, really how what I am telling and I am selling, investing in child protection and well-being since the early age and through a life cycle approach is vital. And it's needed, and we know that it's efficient. So we need really to push this agenda. I will stop here because I can continue a lot. Thank you. I just have to say that what you've told me is to link evidence to the lived experience of children to the investment, but put humanity first. Like that's that grounding, grounding ethos. Thank you very much. Um, so from this, we're going to turn a little bit to implementation. And my question to Ms. McIntyre, the CEO of Special E. European Union program is to kind of like leverage your experience on uh, examining issues of financial investment and delivering impact on the ground. We've just been talking about, you know, on the ground human beings and having the evidence and knowing that investment matter. So can you tell us, you know, how and why the European Union continues to support peace and reconciliation on the island of Ireland and why it has this strong focus on delivering the children-centered initiatives um, in conversation with what we've heard so far. Thank you, Catherine. 
And good morning, Excellencies and distinguished guests. It's an absolute pleasure to be here, and thank you very much for the ECPC for the invitation. Um, the peace programme in Northern Ireland, Ambassador Mythen has, has already set the, the context very well uh, in relation to how the peace programme came about. It, it was as a direct result of the EU wanting to make a positive contribution to the ceasefires in Northern Ireland 25 years ago. And it, at that time, it was the last remaining conflict in Europe. Unfortunately, it's not now, but um, it's a partnership programme between the EU, the Irish government, the government of the UK and also the Northern Ireland Executive, who all contribute financially but also support the programme and day-to-day -day running of the programme. It was always clear that peace is not just the absence of violence. It is a process and it is multi-generational, as we've heard earlier, and all the research is there. And there are too many experts in this room for me to try to, to compete with some of the, the research, but certainly our experience is the intergenerational aspect of the programme um, is so important because this programme is all about building trust and about healing the wounds of the past and, and what we would term the others, the difference, those that are different from us. And I would just say that the programme, although I'm talking about the experiences from Northern Ireland and the border counties of Ireland in relation to our conflict, these lessons that we've learned are, are worldwide for any post-conflict society, but also for um, any disaster recovery zone and indeed from the likes of COVID because there are intergenerational traumas there that will go on for many, many years, unfortunately. The programme was, it gets built on a socioeconomic review of the region, so we really look at and we talk to everybody from the government right down to the public citizens about what is needed, what do they want to see, what do they think was, is going to make a difference and what areas we can support. And all of the programmes have always had two distinct aims, which was to uh, reinforce progress towards a peaceful and stable society and to promote reconciliation. And reconciliation is indeed one of the hardest things. And also to address the legacy of conflict and take the advantages of the opportunities arising from peace. And the programme funds all aspects of society, but I'll just focus on the ones today in relation to what we're talking about. And, and in a way, we, we have developed almost a holistic approach like Chile um, in establishing that ecosystem. And I'm not going to claim it was a strategy, but actually when you see it in this context, it is. Because we fund at all different aspects. We support our young people who... Uh, on the terms of reconciliation and difference, we're most at risk of ending up in paramilitary activity and conflict and violence again. So we support those young people because, as Ambassador Mythen mentioned, it's a segregated society we live in. So young people rarely get a chance to meet together. So what we do is give that support in programmes from the age of 14 up so that they will meet and they will learn that everybody is the same. And it's all about trying to understand and respect one another and their cultures. And to me, that's key in what we're talking about today. Because unfortunately, again, as Ambassador Maiden mentioned, there is a correlation between poverty and violence and economic deprivation. So in a lot of those young people's programmes that we have, and we've funded many, many thousands of children, tens and thousands of children and young people there, those young people are going to become parents probably quite soon in that they are coming from economic deprived areas. So what we're trying to do at this stage with those programmes is also establish them to be good parents, give them good parenting skills because it starts, all of what we're talking about here starts from before the parent is a parent. And so if we can help change some of those attitudes of our young people so that they understand difference and empathy and how to nurture, then we will be able to make changes in the long run. The mental health interventions, we also do those within the programme because we're all very aware about the, the trauma, intergenerational um, health care. And it is very, very significant, in, particularly in post-conflict societies, but as I said, also in disaster zones and the likes of COVID. And just as, as a, a small indication, there were over 200,000 people registered as having a mental health issue post-conflict in Northern Ireland. Now, that was just those that were registered. All of those people probably went on to be parents and indeed grandparents. So when you take that, you're now talking about hundreds of thousands of young people and children 
In a society where we only have a population of in Northern Ireland and the border counties about two and a half million. So you can see the impact that's going to have on the society. And, and that's the same for everyone. We, we've done a lot of work with Columbia as well in the past and, and very honoured to do so. But the cost of dealing with all of that is significant. And if we can go in early in all of these areas to address that in advance, it's going to certainly save it. We've always funded, the peace programmes have always funded uh, childhood development. And indeed, we have sometimes just bought building bricks, um, as you talked about earlier, because in some of the rural communities in particular, it was the only opportunity that some of the parents had to meet. Some of those from different communities had that opportunity so um, to come together and meet each other for the first time. So we did invest in very simple things, um, right up to hopefully uh, buildings that will support childcare. But that intergenerational trauma is so significant for what it passes on to the children. We also fund because of the segregated society and the fact that children do live in and it's, are schooled separately, we fund what's called shared education. It gives these children an opportunity to come together in a classroom-based um, activity they, they meet once a week, uh, whether it's on Zoom or, you know, online. They go for school visits, they go for trips. But So that is just to try to bring them together well in advance of being 18 and maybe meeting at university or in a workplace. But what that's also done is it brought together the teachers, it brings together the parents, and it brings, it's just a much wider wider um, impact on society. And I think that's important. The money is important, it's really important, but we have to start also talking about the impact on society because the fact that with intergenerational trauma, that if a child develops or experiences six childhood adversity experiences in their time, they're going to die 20 years younger than their peer. And when you think about, we can make a difference, we can make such an impact. Thank you. transformative moment that happens when new parents have new life and it's a new life perhaps possibly for society as well as for families uh, last but not least of course my question to Ms. Weston from Sesame Workshop because really you're talking about transforming the lives of children across in, in, you know, in a big in a big space in human, with programs on humanitarian crises um, in divided societies around the world. And we know the program works well, so please, if you could highlight for us how that, what worked well will shape your programming to the, looking to the future. Thank you so much, Catherine. Um, and first, I also want to acknowledge and thank Rima for her incredible leadership and the Early Childhood Peace Consortium for connecting these dots between peace and early childhood and to the governments of Chile, Col Colombia, and Ireland. Thank you for prioritizing early education. So I am grateful. It's, it's really special for Sesame to be able to participate. And I'd love to talk just a little bit about our work in terms of our learnings you know, through this effort. And I will say for those of you who don't know, Sesame Workshop is the global nonprofit um, best known for creating Sesame Street. But we are now actually the largest informal educator in the world, reaching young children in over 150 countries, many of whom have no other their access to quality early education. But we like to say that our sort of um, secret sauce is using the power of media and Muppets. And it's not just to teach letters and numbers, but our Muppets become, you know, trusted friends and, and powerful role models um, who are also modeling empathy and understanding and, and um, showing respect for differences. So I think that when we um, see the power of what we can do, both in terms of influencing, opening hearts and minds around the globe, it is very um, powerful indeed. Now, we've always focused on reaching children in those critical early years when we know we can have the greatest impact. I would normally now talk about the research and why those first five years are the most important in a child's brain development, but I don't think you need me to do that. Um, and you all have laid that out soon so, so effectively, and that's part of the work, the advocacy work that I think you're doing so well. But it's also the time when a child is forming their sense of self and the world around them. And so we believe it's so important that children see positive portrayals 
of themselves on screen. And we work very hard when we create these local productions and adaptations of Sesame that we are creating characters, or Muppet characters, um, in ways that children can identify and storylines that they can relate to. And one of the most essential things for us to do this effectively is to work with local partners on the ground. We work with local educators, local ministries of education, local creative talent, and, and the children and parents themselves to make sure that what we're creating is culturally relevant and that the curriculum is designed to meet those specific needs. Um, I will say that in our work over the years in divided societies, you know, on our productions, Northern Ireland, Kosovo, Israeli-Palestinian productions, you know, the one thing that would allow us to bring partners together from opposite sides was their shared hope for their children. And the work that you refer to, Catherine, um, you know, in about six years ago, we really began working in regions where children were displaced, in regions where children are affected by mm -hmm. conflict and crisis. And that work started in the Middle East. You're going to see a little more. Um, you know, we've expanded to Bangladesh, East Africa, Latin America, and now Ukraine. But what we do in each of these circumstances is we are starting first with content to help address the emotional well-being for not only the children but their parents and providing resources that help them cope with trauma, that help them build resilience, and that still provide opportunities for playful learning in the midst of crisis. As we have looked at more protracted settings, um, we have also begun to infuse uh, curriculum around social cohesion. Thanks to the Hilton Foundation, recently we're doing work in Colombia, Ecuador, and Uganda, where we're doing pilots where the content will be about uh, celebrating children's positive sense of identity and respect for differences and others. And lastly, I will just say that research is a huge part of our DNA, and for those of you who said so, it is so important that we continue to invest in building the evidence to make the case. And in our work with Ahan Simpson, which is, if you don't know, it's the partnership with the International Rescue Committee to bring early childhood education into the Syrian response region. And our partner, Hiro, who, you, who was mentioned before, Dr. Hiro Yoshikawa from uh, NYU, has just completed two randomized control trials. I know he's going to share more about this at UNICEF this afternoon, but just in a nutshell, sort of top line, one was an RCT of our um, in Jordan where we embedded Ahan Simpson content into kindergartens. And the research shows that children's outcomes on identifying emotions, managing emotions, is statistically significant. And we all know that is so important to build the foundation for learning and for you know, relationships with others. The second was an RCT of a remote pre-K, if you will, because in Lebanon during COVID, when we could not be there in person with home visits and learning centers, we used WhatsApp to send a Hunt Simpson contact, uh, content and resources to parents. Then in groups, we had IRC facilitators call those groups of parents twice a week um, to facilitate that engagement. And I want to just point one thing out, that I think one of the most important assets that Sesame has is our very deliberate appeal to adults as well as children. So those resources are tools for the children, but they're also designed to be a catalyst for engagement between adult and child. And I'm thrilled to say that that RCT showed that in 11 weeks, the literacy and numeracy gains for those children was the equivalent to a full year in pre-K. And yes, our content is great and it's educational, but you know that it was also because it was a catalyst for engagement. So in closing, I am thrilled to be able to share a video because I think it will give you a better sense of the power of this work. And, and honestly, if we're not giving these children the opportunity, the support to thrive, how can they possibly be expected to have the skills to rebuild their societies? Mm -hmm. So thank you. Thank you. أنا صار لي تقريبا من وقت من 2012 جينا من بيت بسوريا تدمر يعني وجينا من الحرب جينا لهون من 2012 وعايش بنفس الخيمة تقريبا 
اي عندي اربعه ولاد شي ما سالش نحن ما حبيت اتذكرها يعني بلاس اذا الولد من هلا بيشيل همك معناته ما في ما له مستقبل يعني يعني هي مرحلة مستقبل الطفل هون هو الأساس يعني مش بس إنه أنا بدي أجي وبدك تتعلم هول أحرف الأرقام وخلص بنفل على البيت إيه صاروا سنتين بيروحوا على المركز أهل السمسم يعني في أنا ابني هذا وطني يمكن قلت لك كان نفسيته تعبانة كثير يعني كان مرات صغيرة منافسية ما بعرف إنه فزع وما فزع وهالشيء عم يرتاح نفسيا يعني قلت لك من هالشيء يعني انه لانه بيجي بيروح لهنيك لبرا بيرتاح اكثر بيجي بيروح على المركز تبع الاحداث يعني الدعم النفسي كثير مهم بهذه المرحله عم نحاول دائما نوفر بيئه امنه لإله هذا البرنامج هو موجود بحياتهم دائما متكامل بين المدرسه وبين البيت أهم شيء إنه أول شيء العلم يعني أنا عشت بظروف صعبة يعني دور إنه حياة أفضل يعني Thank you very much. I would just like to close this session. Thank you so very much for our delegates today. Thank you for our audience for listening. Um, and for our delegates, just a second to show actually very this very clear sense of, of the lot of work that needs to be done, very clear sense of how to leverage data and partnerships to have a clear and sustained commitment um, to peace and social inclusion through the work of the children and families. And as we've seen, children and families themselves are very determined and very courageous. And I hope that we are continuing to be very determined and very courageous in our efforts um, in the next four decades. <laughs> Thank you. Catherine, thank you for your facilitation today. We are now at the closing section of our program. I'm delighted to introduce Siobhan Fitzpatrick to, to provide an overview of our call to action and some closing remarks. Dr. Fitzpatrick is the founding member and chairperson of the International Network on Peace Building with Young Children. She is also a founding member and vice chairperson of the Early Childhood Peace Consortium. Siobhan. Thank you, Mark. Madam Chairperson, Excellencies, distinguished guests, friends and colleagues, thank you all for your inspiring and thought-provoking contribution to this morning's important session on the role of early childhood development as a pathway to sustainable peace. I too would like to thank the Chilean, Colombian and Irish missions for their support in making this event happen. As you've heard this morning, 
Over the past 25 years, we in the field of early childhood development and peace building have grown a body of scientific and programmatic knowledge on how investment in services for young children and their family can make a significant contribution to sustainable peace and to the achievement of the Sustainable Development Goals. We also know from our work that investing in parents, and Jim, of course, fathers, but particularly mothers, is critical in peace building. Women are critical partners in shoring up the three pillars of lasting peace. Economic recovery, social cohesion, and political legitimacy. We are indeed very proud of our work, proud of our growing scientific knowledge, proud of our programmatic implementation and expansion to new regions across the globe, proud of our advocacy efforts at local, regional and global level. However, we also know that a peaceful world is becoming more and more elusive. New areas of conflict, record military spending, climate emergency, and low levels of trust between the global north and the global south are constant threats to a peaceful and just world. When we published our book that Josh referred to, From Conflict to Peace Building, in 2007, the Save the Children report then estimated that 40 million children across the globe were directly impacted by conflict. As you have heard from Rima and others this morning, this number is now 468 million living in high intensity conflict countries. As Rima said, the time for action has to be now. We very much welcome the UN Secretary General's new agenda for peace and the common agenda framework leading to the summit of the future next year in September 2024. We endorse the building blocks for collective action and particularly welcome the focus on prevention of conflict as a political priority. The need for robust regional frameworks and organisations focused on peace building, people-centred approaches and robust financial mechanisms to support peace building. However, now we do need bold and ambitious agendas to achieve our objectives. We, the members of the Early Childhood Peace Consortium, ask for support from member states to secure a UN Security Council resolution on early childhood development and peace building to promote peace, social cohesion and social justice. We call on member states to share the knowledge from the research and programmatic evidence and successful peace building initiatives globally that link early childhood development and peace building agendas. The Early Childhood Peace Consortium will be a technical ally and a strong advocate to support UN member states be a champion for young children. We call for a greater inclusion and focus on young children and their families in the ambitious new agenda for peace and our common agenda framework. We ask you to accelerate the achievement of the SDG goals, especially goals 3, 4, 5, 16 and 17, by promoting, investing and operationalising public policy reforms and universal access to services 
that contribute to peace building and the reduction of violence, starting with very young children and their families. And finally, we call on the international community for their unwavering commitment, unwavering commitment to and strong partnerships for implementing and scaling up early childhood services that promote and foster a culture of peace. Learning from and leveraging the expertise and experience of countries and networks like the Early Childhood Peace Consortium and the International Network on Peace Building with Young Children. I would like to end with a well-known Irish proverb, which I think captures our intentions. Our skith a kela, a warren nadina. People live in each other's shadow. We need each other to build the foundations for a peaceful world. Thank you. Our final speaker today, we're delighted to have with us Irina Dia, Associate Director for Early Childhood Development at UNICEF. Dr Dia, the Global Lead for ECD at UNICEF, and is driven by desire that all girls and boys get the best start in life through adequate policies, programmes and parenting practices that protect and fulfil their survival, growth and development rights of all children in early life, including those in fragile and humanitarian settings. Irina. Thank you so much. I feel a bit redundant here now that Jim started by uh, what I was, with what I was supposed to do. Thank you everybody for being here today. But since I've been formatted by my parents and the French uh, education system to follow instructions, I will <laughs> diligently go through my list here. So first I would like to thank you, Choban and uh, Rima, for your leadership and all the members of the Early Childhood Peace Consortium for the relentless efforts to demonstrate that we can indeed build a more peaceful world by investing in our children and their families. I would like to thank you, Excellencies, for being here today, for agreeing to join us on this path in its journey to host this important event that would not have taken place today if it was not for you. But also to the more extensive group of friends and countries that have made deliberate steps to champion early childhood development. I would also like to thank all the panelists for sharing their ideas, their views, their experience. I would like to thank you, Dr. Shah, for sharing a very personal experience and asking us some questions that I hope when we next meet or in the future, sooner than later, we'll be able to have answers to. I would also like to thank Sherry, our partner, key partner. When you say that, you do get some of these puppets, so that's why I'm doing it. But thank you so much you know, for being here for all participants for giving two hours of your time by being here with us, really demonstrating how important this uh, agenda is for you. And for everybody, the masters of ceremony, facilitator, organizers, and just to make sure I don't forget anybody, thank you, everyone. Um, as you may know, and I do hope that you know that, that UNICEF has always been a big champion for early childhood development. And the role that young children and their caregivers can play contributing to more cohesive and peaceful societies through nurturing empathy, resilience, peaceful resolution of conflict and sociability. We have also been a big believer and supporter of, supporter of the Early Childhood Peace Consortium since its exception more than 10 years ago, grounded in the conviction of the connection between early childhood development and social cohesion. Everything we shared here today is in line with our new vision, UNICEF vision for early childhood development that does underline this connection between positive and healthy and early environments and peace building, more sustainable nations, more inclusive societies, and also more egalitarian families and communities. But we are not done today. Following this session, there will be an event across the house uh, from here. Um, that's going to give us the opportunity to listen to a choir, a children's choir, that will premiere an anthem called Seeds of Peace, composed by Jeffrey Hudson. And I could not leave before reminding us 
you know, of the words that were used by Rima, Suma, Sherban, that we must take action and the time to take action is now. So let's not this session be another one of people exactly. preaching to the converted that we are, but let's take action, spread the world, talk to governments, convince governments, societies, communities, children themselves, that we all have a part to play in all this, and make sure that we invest more in early childhood development so that all children everywhere, but especially in emergency settings, to have access to a better chance in life. Thank you.